Welcome to Today's Economy. My name is Kevin Press. My guest today is Jeff Rubin. He's author of the book, The End of Growth. The book makes a very simple point. Economic growth requires affordable fuel. And to the extent that fuel prices continue to rise, there's reason for pessimism about economic growth projections going forward. Jeff, thanks very much for joining us. Oil prices have quadrupled in the last decade. Can you explain that for us? Well, I guess a basic mismatch between demand and supply, that as oil prices go higher and higher, the world's never been thirstier for the stuff. And it's not that there isn't oil or that we'll ever run out of the stuff, but the kind of sources that the world's now turning to for supply, be it the tar sands, Brazilian subsalt, the oil shales in the Bakken's, that those those sources of supply don't flow at the kind of prices motorists would like to fill up at the pump set. In fact, you've argued that the financial crisis and the recession that followed had more to do with energy prices than it did with the U.S. housing market. I mean, I see the last recession as an energy shock, plain and simple, like 73, 79, 91. All past energy shocks have had an inflationary fallout that resulted in a fatal growth-ending rise in interest rates. And that's exactly what happened, that the Fed funds rate went from bubble conditions, 1%, to 55 and pricked the bubble. But what forced, at a reluctant Fed, what forced Greenspan to raise interest rates? And he did so only reluctantly. Inflation went from 1% to 5.5%. And what drove that? Well, oil prices went from $30 to almost $150. If oil would have stayed at $30 a barrel, probably all those people in Cleveland with subprime mortgages would still be in their homes. Probably Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns would probably still be in existence. And I'd probably still be the chief economist of CIBC World Markets. This misread has led to bad policy making in your view. Well, first of all, I don't think interest rates had any business being at 1% in 2004. And for that matter, I don't think interest rates have any business being at 1% right now. But I guess, you know, the biggest policy mistakes is not to recognize that when the price of oil changes, it changes the speed limit in which your economy can grow. And I don't think there's any recognition of that at the Bank of Canada or at the Federal Reserve Board. So that they believe that the economy can continue to grow at the same 3% pace that they estimated it used to grow at when oil was $20 a barrel. And hence, they keep their foot on the accelerator. Whether we're talking about a trillion dollar plus deficit in the states or zero interest rates. And I think those policies are not only not going to be effective, they're going to make the transition to triple digit oil prices even more difficult than it would otherwise be. Because debt is oil. You know, if you look at if you look at the Euro Pact right now, all those billions of euros of debt, they just as might as well be denominated in barrels of oil. Because the only way that Greece or Portugal, Ireland, or Spain is going to be able to grow their way out to service the debt is by burning more and more oil. Unfortunately, the problem is that Brent's already about $115 a barrel, and if European growth picks up, it'll be $130 a barrel. So as I say, all that debt might as well be denominated in barrels of oil. And so the message to the rest of us is learn to live with less energy. That's right. And, and that's, you know, that's not a message that we always want to hear. In the fullness of time, from the perspective of economic history, I'm sure that we'll ultimately come up with a substitute for oil as a transit fuel. But in the here and now, you know, instead of trying to turn cow dung into high octane fuel, we're just going to have to learn to drive less. Mm -hmm. And really, the solution is reining in energy demand. But when you go to places like Denmark, Germany, Japan, you can see that this can be done. And this can be done with surprisingly small economic and social costs. And prepare for a different kind of downturn. You write about a permanent slowdown in economic growth. Right. I'm not talking about, you know, people ask me, will there be another recession? Yes, but a recession is a three to four quarter event. I'm talking about something more fundamental. I'm talking about a big flat line. You know, I'm talking about us not growing or growing at a fraction of the pace that we've grown before. I would be talking something if you want to, like, try to picture something, like Japan's lost decade. 
So I'm talking about a permanent ratcheting down in economic growth. And I think the best way to adapt to that is, first of all, A, to recognize that that is happening and not trying to artificially stimulate the economy, because that's just going to, in the end, make us grow even slower. And B, I think we're going to find, to our surprise, more than a few silver linings in that world. For instance, we're not going to emit half the carbon that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicts we're going to emit in the next 20 years. Not because the oil and coal does not exist, but it does not exist at prices that we will be able to afford to burn. The notion of China doubling its coal consumption in the next 20 years, when it's already consuming 3.2 trillion tons of coal a year, is in my mind utter nonsense. I'd like to know exactly at what prices these climate change modelers are assuming that China will be paying for coal. They're already paying over $100 a ton, similarly for oil. So I think that what we're going to find is even our own inexorable path to self-destruction is going to run out of fuel. Thanks. And to many people, that's a very good thing. Thanks very much, Jeff. This is Kevin Press reporting for BrighterLife.ca.